Good afternoon. I'm Paul Ramsey. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of uh, UW Medicine and Dean of the University of Washington School of Medicine. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the 68th Annual Strauss Lecture. Uh, welcome. This is a uh, tradition uh, that dates back now to 1950, and we are so grateful uh, to the Strauss and the Friedlander family for uh, sponsoring this lecture. This carries on a tradition uh, that was established uh, initially by Dr. Alfred Strauss. Dr. Strauss gave the first lecture in 1950. As, uh, Dr. Strauss was an honor graduate of the University of Washington in 1904. He was an outstanding uh, student and an outstanding, a truly outstanding member of the Alumni Association in 1951, he received the singular honor of alumnus uh, summa laude, uh, laude dignitas. Dr. Strauss was a football player and a baseball star as an undergraduate. As an alumnus, he was active in the recruitment and establishment of scholarships for athletes at the University of Washington. He personally recruited more than 75 football players to come from the Chicago area to Seattle. 75 of these football players uh, 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 attended the University of Washington, and five became All-Americans. In 1981, Dr. Strauss himself was elected to the Husky Hall of Fame. I'm also very pleased to say that Dr. Strauss was a fan of rowing. And uh, a shell in the Husky crew house, in the Conabare crew house, uh, was uh, named, uh, as you see in this uh, photo. Dr. Strauss received his MD at Rush University of Chicago Medical School in 1908. He graduated first in his class. He interned for two years at Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago and completed a brief surgical fellowship under Professor Enderlin in Heidelberg, Germany. He then returned to Chicago where he spent his entire medical career. Dr. Strauss possessed a rare combination of skill, vision, and drive and was ultimately involved with many firsts in the field of surgery. These included refinements of pyloroplasty, subtotal gastrectomy for peptic ulcer disease, surgical advances in inflammatory bowel disease, and the first description of an abdominal wall, quote, zipper, to facilitate frequent uh, re-explorations. Dr. Strauss and his two physician brothers, Herman and Siegfried, also University of Washington uh, undergraduates, uh, undergraduate alumni, founded Weiss Memorial Hospital in 1953 in Chicago. Dr. Strauss is well remembered for his influence uh, also in founding our School of Medicine, the University of Washington School of Medicine. On July 22, 1944, Dr. Strauss is a member of the proposed medical school committee. We had a committee called Propose a Medical School. Um, met with the then Governor uh, Langley and strongly advocated for state funding for a new medical school. An appropriation bill was signed soon thereafter by the Governor and uh, in the fall of 1946, the UW School of Medicine welcomed its first graduating class. True to his continued interest in this institution, Dr. Strauss sponsored a surgical lectureship that began in 1950 and, as I've already mentioned, delivered the first lecture himself. This has become uh, our most prestigious event, and we are, are pleased to welcome each year a true leader uh, internationally in the field of surgery. Today's program is sponsored by, is supported by the Alfred uh, A. Strauss, MD, Endowed Lectureship in Surgery. This endowment was established by the estate of Mrs. Marjorie Friedlander, the daughter of Dr. Strauss. It's annually supported by generous uh, contributions from Dr. Strauss's nephew, Dr. Dr John Strauss. We are very fortunate today to have Dr. John Strauss here in the, in the front, front row, along with John Friedlander, who is the grandson of Dr. Alfred Strauss. Thank you both very much for your support.
Welcome. I'm uh, D Doug Wood, the chair of the Department of Surgery, and so it's an honor and privilege for me to introduce this year's 68th uh, annual Alfred A. Strauss uh, lecture, Dr. Andrea Pusick. Uh, but I also, before doing that, I just want to thank Drs. John Strauss and, and John Friedlander for being here, for your ongoing support, and for the incredible legacy that uh, Alfred A. Strauss has in the UW School of Medicine and in the field of surgery locally and nationally. So, uh, in introducing Dr. Pusick, I, I want to highlight a few things. First and foremost, she's Canadian. And as noted, uh, as, as noted uh, by our chief of plastic surgery, Nick Vetter, the best plastic surgeons in the world are Canadian. Um, and in fact is, a third of our plastic surgery faculty are Canadian, it turns out. And what I'm worried about, because I'm always worried about you know, victimhood, and, uh, and I'm worried that our, the rest of our plastic surgeons who are from the less sophisticated southern neighbor of Canada are going to somehow feel uh, less important. But you're not. I mean, you know, there, are, there is really good plastic surgery that originates in uh, the United States as well. Uh, but uh, Dr. Pusick was born in Montreal, raised in Western Canada, attended the University of Calgary for undergrad and medical school, uh, did a master's in epidemiology at Johns Hopkins, uh, did general surgery at Dalhousie University and, um, and plastic surgery training at McGill. Uh, and then did some additional fellowship training at Memorial Sloan Kettering, so it's one of those perpetual uh, a trainee educator. Um, but an interesting f uh, fact about Dr. Pusick is that when she finished internship, she wasn't that sure about what she wanted to do. So she served as a general practitioner in the Canadian Arctic uh, with the Canadian Northern Medical Service and was in a pretty remote uh, area and a pretty cold area, colder than even Alberta. Uh, and learned that she liked doing things uh, and that doing things were procedural issues and I think that led to her interest in surgery. And during that same time she spent time as a general practitioner in South Africa during a period of, of violence relating to apartheid with burn injuries and other injuries and, and likewise found that the professional and personal uh, sense of accomplishment uh, of being able to fix a problem and make something better, uh, I think is ultimate what directed her to a career in surgery and a career in plastic surgery. As a plastic surgeon, she's professor of surgery uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, she's a world-renowned uh, reconstructive breast plastic surgeon uh, and is, is well known for her clinical accomplishments in the area of reconstructive surgery. As an academic surgeon, she's held a number of, of research grants from uh, uh, federally funded research grants, including the principal investigator of the National Breast Implant Registry and the investigator of the Mastectomy Reconstruction Outcomes Consortium. Her achievements in research were recognized by the American Association of Plastic Surgeons who awarded her the Research Achievement Award and a Distinguished Service Award from the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. She's authored more than 200 articles and has mentored numerous students, residents, and junior faculty throughout various stages of their academic career. And I learned that just last week she was elected president-elect of the Plastic Surgery Foundation and the American Society for Plastic Surgery. So, interestingly, in spite of all of these accomplishments, often what Dr. Pusick is most known for is her research focus on the measurement of quality of life and patient satisfaction in surgery. <laughs> she developed a patient-reported outcomes measurement that she developed for breast surgery along with her colleagues called the Breast Q. And that's been widely adopted for research and clinical care and translated to over 30 languages 
and used by the National Health Service in Great Britain as used as a national audit for mastectomy and reconstruction outcomes. Her team's work to develop the breast cue has resulted in developing similar measures of, of outcomes uh, known as the face cue for facial reconstructive surgery, the body cue for bariatric and body contouring surgery, and the cleft cue for uh, uh, reconstruction of cleft lip and palate. Throughout her career, she's been involved in a number of research studies that really look at the patient perspective on surgical outcomes and experiences. And I put up here a great quote from Dave Flum about the impact that uh, Dr. Pusick has had in, in surgical outcomes and the patient perception of surgical outcomes. So an incredible aspect of plastic surgery is that it's defined by the aspect of rebuilding lives, whether those lives are disabled because of congenital uh, problems, injury, or, or cancer. And Dr. Pusick is a great example of those principles of plastic surgery as I've described in her clinical care, but also in her academic accomplishments. And then finally, in humanitarian work that she does as Vice President of the Women for Women Reconstructive Surgery Project. <laughs> So Dr. Pusick, we're really excited to have you here as our 68th annual Alfred A. Strauss Visiting Professor and giving us your lecture on patient reported outcomes in surgery, improving clinical care and quality. Thank you, Dr. Woods, and thank you to all of you. I, I am just honored to be here and thrilled. Um, thank you. Traditionally, when we've looked at our outcomes in surgery, we've considered things primarily from the clinician's perspective. So in surgery, that means we look at our complications, our morbidity, our mortality. But increasingly, we've become aware of the importance of the patient's perspective. So what's the reason for the change? Well, historically, just about everything we did in surgery was to save a life. And so in that situation, the patient's perception of it, perspective, was not necessarily either required or relevant. But increasingly, so much of what we do in surgery is with the goal of improving quality of life, alleviating symptoms. And often it is our patients who are the best judge of whether success has, has occurred. Why do patient report outcomes matter? This is a quote from Andrew Vallance Owen, who was one of the leaders of the work in the United Kingdom in patient report outcomes. He says, for patients, there must be more to success than alive or dead, complications, no complications. How often have we heard, my hip replacement went well, but I'm now housebound. He says, I have good flow in my graft, but I still get pain after 10 meters. For patients, there has to be more than alive or dead, complications, no complications. This is, this, is what, this is what patient report outcomes are all about. What are patient report outcomes? Patient report outcomes are those aspects of outcome that only a patient can know and tell us about. So I think about patient report outcomes in three main areas. I think about symptoms. So pain is a patient report outcome. I can only know how much pain you're in if I ask you. 
quality of life. So these are things like psychosocial, physical, physical function, sexual well-being, and experience, patient's perception of their experience in our care. We measure patient report outcomes with something called patient report outcome measures, or PROMs. These are questionnaires, but not in the way that we would traditionally think about questionnaires. Instead, they're actually precise, reliable measurement tools, really measurement tools in the same way we would think about using a blood pressure cuff to measure blood pressure, temperature to you to measure uh, of a temperature, a thermometer to measure temperature. I think in surgery and in healthcare overall, patient point outcome measurement can be of tremendous value. And I'd like to think about, and I think about these sort of four spheres. And this is what, in the course of our, our time together, I'd like to kind of walk us through that. Clinical care, understanding individual, improving individual patient care through patient, routine patient point outcome measurement. <coughs> quality, when we have limited resources, how can, we, how can we improve quality in the most impactful way from the patient's perspective? Value, we live in a world of cost constraints. How can we best spend our, our, our healthcare budgets in a way that matters most to patients? And comparative effectiveness. How do we differentiate what's new from what's new and actually better from the patient perspective? So beginning with clinical care. So as Dr. Woods has said, I, uh, my team developed something called the BreastQ. The BreastQ is a patient report outcome measure that measures outcomes specific to breast surgery patients. I won't go into all the details of the development and validation of the breast cube, but just to give you a sense of the scope of the project, this was a large, this was a big project. We had help from over 2,000 women. Can you hear me in the back? I'm going to lean in a bit more there. Um, we had help from over 2,000 women, and the breast cube has subsequently been validated in a sample of over 50,000 patients. As mentioned, it's been translated and linguistically validated in over 30 languages and is now part of the ICHOM standard order set. So the breast cue measures different aspects of outcome from the patient perspective. So quality of life, things like physical, psychosocial, or sexual well-being, and aspects of satisfaction. So I'll just give you an example of what one of these scales would look like that a patient would actually see. So this is our scale, patient satisfaction with breasts. And it asks questions that range on a continuum from how a woman may be satisfied with how she looks in her clothes to how the softness of a reconstructed breast to how she looks in the mirror naked. How a patient answers these questions is summed together in a 0 to 100 number, with a higher number meaning higher satisfaction, or for different scales, better quality of life. So we use the breast cue in all at Sloan Kettering and in other centers around the world and elsewhere in the U.S. We use it as a component of routine clinical care, so every patient is invited to complete the breast cue, and those results are reviewed with the patient. So this is an example of a patient who has a tissue expander. So a tissue expander is one of the techniques we use in breast reconstruction. And this, you can see in this patient, so it, on the y-axis, all right, on the y-axis up here is patient's out, is, is physical well-being with the breast cube. And, this, and the points that you see are points over time. And so you can see, and the, uh, my nurses would see that this dramatic drop at two weeks after surgery, which might be expected, but this will, in, in this situation, would trigger perhaps a referral to physical therapy or to pain management. This is another patient of mine that's had reconstruction using abdominal tissue. And so you can see on the, the x-axis, these are the various time points that this, uh, of the assessment of this patient. And so you can see preoperatively and how she's recovering chest and upper body and how she's recovering from an abdominal perspective. This kind of information that we see on an, an individual patient doesn't replace a conversation with our patients, but it, rather it targets it. It makes it actually more effective and frankly also more efficient. Instead of walking in and saying, how are you? My nurses and I will have already reviewed this information, and we already know that we need to, to, to engage with the patient around these issues. Finally, this is an additional patient of mine. And so what we see here, this is sat patient satisfaction with breast, psychosocial, and sexual well-being. Now, this is only the third breast key report that you have all seen, but at a glance, you can see as well that this is a patient who over time, and these are at six-month intervals, is not doing very well. Well, this is my own patient, and I actually didn't pick up on this. This is a lovely woman who would never, never complain about anything. But what she had is over time was having gradually scar tissue forming around her implants that was actually causing a lot of distress. And so walking in with this report allowed me to address those issues and say, you know, let's talk about this. And this is a patient who's actually having surgery in the fall. So the idea behind this being is, is it, well, it allows us to understand issues that we might, other, might otherwise have been unrecognized <coughs> and needs that would otherwise have been unmet. This is not breast data. This is from the University of Utah. And they do some great work in patient report outcome measurement at the University of Utah. But I would use this graphic to illustrate some of the challenges that we face in patient report outcome measurement. 
This is similarly, this is a series of other questionnaires, more general in terms of anxiety, depression. But this is a patient who had surgery. At a glance, understanding this graphic, we're not seeing a lot of changes over time. And so for a clinician, it's not as easily interpretable and understandable. And so we have to be careful in terms of how we display our information and the kinds of measures that we're using so that it's actually actionable and understandable. As another example, when we're looking at new information, it has to be understandable at a glance. And so again, these are questions. This is a patient who had bariatric surgery at this time point, but the graphs are going in different directions. So on some scales, down is good, and, and on others, up is good. And so in terms of, this is a brave new world. This is a new field for us, and understanding how we put these graphics together so that at a glance, as clinicians, we can understand it and intervene. One of the things that's very exciting, I think, in terms of this whole arena, when I started in this work, we were doing paper and pencil. That's why when you see the, that, when you see the breast cue scale, it, it looks like something we did on paper and pencil because that's how we started. But now everything's electronic. And so we have new technologies in terms of our phones, ways that we can interact with patients that we never had before. This opens up a lot of opportunities for us. So at my hospital, Sloan Kettering, we opened a new ambulatory surgery center and we've now integrated patient port outcome measurement into all phases of care via our patient portal and via patients' phones or their, um, or their laptops or iPads. Just give you an example of one way that we've looked at it in terms of um, issues around following patients symptomatically. So we opened this new ambulatory surgery center, and, and because of advances in surgery and because of anesthetic technique advances, we can now do some really pretty major surgeries and send people home 23 hours later. There's a lot of advantages to that. But it also places additional burden on patients and their caregivers. Patients are expected to go home, and they're, man they're expected to manage their recovery largely on their own and to kind of reach out to call us if they think their complication is happening. The problem is, is patients don't necessarily know what to expect, and they don't necessarily know when something, um, when something may, be, may be going wrong or maybe everything's fine. They don't have that support of 24-hour nursing. They don't see the surgeon every morning on morning rounds. So we started to think about what else can we do about that. We also rec recognize, and this is research from others, that we as clinicians tend to minimize symptoms. So this is work from Ethan Bash's group. It's actually in medical oncology. But what we see from this is that systematically, patients' perceptions of symptoms is, is more severe than ours. And that's understandable because we're not the ones experiencing the symptoms. So our perception looking at how much pain you're in is not, is not necessarily as accurate as if I ask you how much pain you're in. So with that, that in mind, we set up a system in our ambulatory surgery center very shortly after it opened where we ask patients on a daily basis about 11 symptoms, things like pain, nausea, vomiting, um, all the things that happen after surgery. It takes between two and three minutes to, fin to do this, this very brief questionnaire. And when patients report severe symptoms, then that triggers a, phone, it triggers a message to the nurse, and a nurse reaches out and calls the patient. So for those 10 days, we're providing surveillance effectively. It's kind of like a, you've left the building, but we've still got you. Someone's still watching out. Um, and patients are also advised to call us if they need to. But having established that system, we started to think, well, what could we do that could be more than that? As opposed to a patient just waiting, you know, you, you put your symptoms in, and then you wait to see if the phone rings later that day. Is this a problem? Is it not a problem? Because what we were hearing from patients was, I don't know if this is okay. If it's okay, then I'm okay, but I don't, I don't know. We thought about ways that we could maybe give patients more information and autonomy so they could better understand and manage their symptoms. And so this is what we came up with. So after a patient does that two to three minutes of reporting their symptoms, this is the graphic that they would see, a report on their symptoms that helps them understand it. So this is a patient who is four days after um, surgery, and what we're seeing here is Moderate pain, as has been reported, moderate pain. Moderate pain four days after surgery is nothing to be worried about. Um, and what it also gives, if you can see the graphic here, is the severity and watching it over time. That graphic is based on information that other patients have provided and is updated on a continual basis. So not only do you see that moderate pain on day four after surgery is to be expected, that patient can also see that by day eight, they should expect to be more or less pain free. So it's helping to also understand the trajectory. This would be an example of a different patient on day four. Here, this patient has reported um, moderately severe shortness of breath on day four. Well, that's actually not okay, and hence that patient is, is encouraged and told to give us a call, because it's another thing we picked up is patients don't necessarily want to bother us. They want, they want and so to have to say, yes, please give us a call. We'd like to hear from you. 
at the same time, they, they could toggle in and get more information to say, again, this is shortness of breath day four, after day four is not expected. So we did a lot of interviewing with patients, talking to patients about trying to understand what, you know, what, what, what's the experience of care in ambulatory surgery. And so before we started any of this work, this is kind of what we were hearing. We heard, I worried about everything, looking for problems. When we started the daily symptom monitoring, without this enhanced feedback, we heard things like, I felt more connected and cared for for a longer time period. And then subsequently, we put this enhanced feedback, these reports, this is the kind of thing we heard. I felt more in control, like I didn't just have to wait and wonder if everything was OK. So we're actually now, we, um, we successfully applied for PCORI funding, um, and I'm very grateful to PCORI for this funding. And what we're doing now is we're doing a randomized trial to understand the impact of this enhanced feedback, to understand from a patient perspective how valuable this is. And so we're actually randomizing patients to either enhanced feedback or just standard monitoring. And these are some of the outcomes that we're looking at. So returning to our emergency department, what we see is there's a, there's a reasonable proportion of patients that are the worried well. They come in and they're actually OK, but they're not sure, so they come into our emergency department. On the other hand, there's, there's people who are having an adverse event and they're sitting at home. And so looking at those kinds of things. Also understanding things about patient anxiety, engagement, and caregiver burden, because looking after a patient at home and, and wondering, is my, wife, is my wife OK? Is my husband OK? That we're, um, that's something that we're also hoping to intervene to help with. The, the system may help. So that's clinical care. Let's move to quality. We've increasingly realized that understanding, measuring patients, listening to patients has the potential to improve quality. But quality is not just about patient part outcomes. Optimizing, if we really want to op optimally think about quality, it's a, it's a diagram thinking about both patient report outcomes and clinician report outcomes. What you want to be, um, if you look so on the y-axis, patient report outcomes, x-axis, clinician report outcomes, that green circle is ideally where we would be. The best patient report outcomes with the lowest risk of complications and the lowest morbidity mortality. I'll be an example of exactly how we're doing this at Memorial. So this is data from our urology group. And so here, this is patients who have had prostatectomy surgery. And on the y-axis here, potency and continence, so erectile function, urinary function. And on the x-axis is disease, disease recurrence, um, being free of disease. And so again, just like that green circle, that's where we want our outcomes to be. We want the best quality of life outcomes, at the same time the lowest risk of complications. And so that's really the nuance. It's not about one or the other. It's now about both. So often I'm asked in terms of talking about patient report outcomes, is it all about patient report outcomes? No, it's not. This is complementary information that fills out our understanding of surgical outcomes from the patient perspective. Just another example again from our ambulatory surgery work at Memorial. So imagine we open this new ambulatory surgery um, center, and it's gorgeous. It's really beautiful. And it's very patient-centered right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it, it's working really well. And so but right from the beginning, we started to ask um, a survey called the SCAP survey, which was developed by the American College of Surgeons, to understand patient perceptions of the surgical experience, so patient satisfaction with the process of care. And so, we're, so we started right from, the, from day one asking all our patients about um, the SCAP survey. And what we found, we were doing pretty well. But surgeon attentiveness on day of surgery, that, that was 25%, if you can see that, the 25% in the red. 25% of our patients were not happy with surgeon attentiveness. Now, our, I would say I, we have a good group of surgeons, and that was not the case in our, in our main hospital. And so we looked at that, and we did sort of a deeper dive in terms of what the questions looked like, what, 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 was, what was really going on. And what it was is patients were dissatisfied with discussions about, it was, they were just with the visit of the surgeon, they were dissatisfied with the visit bef uh, before the surgery, meaning they didn't feel that they saw their surgeon before they went to sleep, and discussions about the outcome after surgery. What we realized was is we built this very successful, very efficient surgical center, which was a new model of care for our, our oncologic surgeons. And, and people were in and out of the building before they could be seen by their surgeon. They were in the OR before the surgeon got a chance to say hello at the bedside, and they were out again before the surgeon could get back. So it was a process issue. And so we looked at the process issue. We've now developed different pathways, iPads, Skyping from the OR, making sure the phone call happens all kinds of different processes to help our surgeons being able to connect with patients and their families on the day of surgery more efficiently. And now we're continuing to collect SCAPS data now that we've made these changes to see if we can kind of shift the needle. I'm a big believer that 
in terms of as we assess patient board outcomes as a, as a mechanism to improve quality of care, that having that as a part of, um, so improving quality, but using those same patient board outcome measures that we use in routine care, because as clinicians, we become familiar with them. So for example, with the rescue, I'm used to seeing the rescue in my clinic. I know what those numbers mean. And so when you start using the rescue as my quality metric, I get it. I don't feel like it's, you're pulling something off the shelf that doesn't, isn't really relevant to me. So as an example, the BreastQ, we, we have a scale that's called satisfaction with information, and on the, similar to the satisfaction with breast um, questions, it goes from questions like, the surgeon told me what the, how he or she was going to do the surgery and what the complications could be, but on the sort of higher end kinds of things you talk about are what recovery was going to be like and what I could expect in terms of the outcomes of surgery, what other women had experienced. So on every patient that I walk in to see, I also see her assessment of, how, of satisfaction with information, how well she was informed. So I'm, I'm continually getting feedback, and honestly, sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes I thought I'd done a better job than I did, and it makes me pause and think, hmm, maybe I need to go back in and talk some more, or I need to up my game. I'll show you this was used on an even larger scale. Um, this is data from the United Kingdom that we mentioned in terms of the national audit. So a few years ago, across the whole United Kingdom, the breast was administered as part of an audit at three and 18 months. And so this is a funnel plot. And each of those dots is a surgical unit in the United Kingdom. And on the y-axis, again, that's the breast satisfaction with information. And so what you see here is that line going down in the middle is average. And the, these three dots here are surgical units that fell two standard, more than two standard deviations below their peers in terms of how they were informing patients. This is actually an easy fix, and that's exactly what happened in the United Kingdom related to this kind of data and other data that came from the audit, that these, these individuals or these centers were identified and provided with coaching and feedback from the high-performing centers, actually, in terms of the, the centers that patients were rating very highly in terms of how well they were being informed, and they made significant changes that, al that ultimately improved patient care. In the U.S. now, we're hearing a lot in terms of performance measures, and so you'll be hearing, we've talked about PROs, you'll be hearing more, so we hear, talked about PROMs, but you're going to be hearing more and more about PROPMs, um, a patient report outcomes as performance measures. One of the challenges that we face is that of the close to 2,000 NQF-endorsed measures, only um, a minority are, a, a majority are process, a minority are outcome, and within that, of the whole to that less than 2% are patient reported of the outcome measures. So there's lots of work to do in terms of bringing patient board outcome measurement into the world of performance. The American College of Surgeons is very committed to this, and so um, many of you will be aware of the NISQIP um, platform, which is our, um, our quality registry. And so with Cliff Coe, Larissa Temple, and Franco Palco, we've been working very hard to incorporate patient report outcomes into NISQIP and really realizing that the patient perspective really is the missing piece of the quality pie, and how do we do that? And it's obviously not, an, um, it's not straightforward, but there's lots of work being done, and it's actually very close to, um, to fruition. In putting this program together, these are the kinds of principles that we've, um, when moving patient board outcomes into NISQIP, We've, these are the guiding principles have been that we have to use state-of-the-art electronic means, that we, there's so much that can be done now off of phones. Um, we have to think about psychometric soundness, this idea of patient board outcome measures as real measurement tools that are accurate and reliable and precise, so choosing the best measures, minimizing patient burden, making sure that we're not sending too many surveys to patients such that they're not going to engage with us around that. Um, and, and probably most important, that this information is actionable. The most important thing is we collect information, and, and either it makes me do something or understand something on an individual patient level, or on a quality level that it identifies something that we could improve upon, or a, um, something that, a, a deficit that we can do something about. So with the key that everything that we're looking for would be actionable. <coughs> Moving to value. So we clearly live in a time where healthcare costs are rising. We're under a lot of pressure in that regard. We need, we, um, how, how do we provide the best outcomes for our patients, but in an environment of, of pretty tight cost constraints? Traditionally, we think about value as outcomes over cost. Well, here's what I propose, is that it's not going to be just outcomes the way we've previously been thinking about it, but patient, in many situations, it's going to be patient report outcomes over the cost. I would actually put together that a lot of things, it'll be patient report outcomes, clinician report outcomes over cost. But this is, but to be able to do that, we have to be measuring our patient report outcomes on a regular basis in a rigorous fashion. 
this is already happening elsewhere in the world, and as I, I've mentioned a number of times, the, the UK experience. So in the UK now, the PROMS initiative has been going for a number of years, and so for certain of these index procedures like groin hernia, hip and knee replacement, varicose vein surgery, it's mandatory that patient report outcomes, um, that PROMS are completed before and after surgery. And with the idea that if, um, particularly in the NHS system, so the taxpayers are paying for this, we're making decisions about the operations that, that are being paid for, so it's important to know that the operation that was designed to either improve function or decrease pain really did that, and that that's what we're seeing. And so, so in the UK now, that is a mandatory program. It's been, it's been successful. Um, and even for surgeons to be able to continue to offer that operation, to be paid to do that surgery, then PROM data is required. And, and with that, though, we see some great things. Oops, let me back up here. We see some great information about the relative. So going this way is the percent improvement and this way that things were made worse. And so it's the idea that we need to be thinking about this, but measuring patient report outcomes on a routine basis. And so finally moving into the world of comparative effectiveness. So as I said, thinking about how do we discern what's new from what's new and actually better. So there's been so much that we've done in robotic surgery, laparoscopic surgery, all kinds of things, um, the different techniques that, uh, that were in plastic surgery, we, there's something new coming all the time. We tend to be a very innovative specialty. But it's tricky sometimes to understand, is it actually better from the patient perspective? Maybe give just one, e one example of a, of a study that um, was just published, that I led this work, and it was just published in JCO in the spring. This was an NCI R01 funded study it was called the Mastectomy Reconstruction Outcome Consortium. <coughs> and and in this study, really, it was kind of trying to get the, at the heart of breast reconstruction from the patient's perspective. And the question really was, what works best of the different reconstructive techniques that we have? So the objective was to compare differences in patient report outcomes across procedure types in immediate reconstruction. Now, this study is a, um, is, is a plastic surgery breast reconstruction technique uh, study. But I would challenge you, if your clinical area is different, to think about what other you know, whether it's urology or orthopedics, this model is, is kind of the same, is to understand the various techniques and options that we talk to our patients about. You, know, you can have this or you can have that. And patients say, and we, and we talk about the complications, but patients say, well, what are the results like? What does it, that, and that's, that's the crux of it. Patients want to know what the patient report outcomes are comparing across different um, procedures. So what we did is we had 11 sites, uh, 57 surgeons, um, and a cohort of, of over 2,000 patients that we followed, pre, collected preoperatively at one year and then at two years. And we had about two-thirds were implant reconstruction and one-third were flap reconstructions. And here's what we found. So in comparison to patients who had breast implants, patients who had reconstruction using their own tissue for breast reconstruction at one and two years reported greater satisfaction with their breast greater sexual well-being, better psychosocial well-being, and physical well-being of the chest. Now, this doesn't mean that all patients should be told they, should have, they, they can't have implants, they should have autologous reconstruction, not at all. But it's, it's complementary information that we have previously not been able to provide to our patients in, a, in, a, in, a, in anything other than a gestalt kind of a way. And this is really, this is the information that patients are asking for. A patient might still choose to have implant reconstruction because it's a shorter recovery, because she's slender, because she's at abdominal surgery. There's a myriad of other reasons. But when a patient's making decisions, this is the kind of information that we can now provide to her. A question to ask is, you know, how meaningful are these differences? So these are numbers, and what's the difference? It's kind of a big study, so you can reach statistical significance pretty easily. So looking at these differences, so psychosocial and physical well-being at two years out, we talk about minimally important differences. So what's the difference that a patient would actually be able to detect? Well, at two years, the psychosocial and sexual difference, or psychosocial and physical difference, was a small difference, statistically significant, but small. Keep in mind, these are women that are two years out from surgery, so, and these are, these kinds of, co what we call the construct, is kind of a little more distal to the issue of just mastectomy. Sexual well-being, the difference between flaps and implants, was a moderate difference. And satisfaction with breasts was a large difference. So again, not to say that all patients should have autologous reconstruction, but it is information that we can all now use um, in our discussions with patients. And I would also add in terms of now the other piece to bring into that in, this, in, in our discussions is complications and also cost. And that's sort of, I think, once we bring those different pieces of information together, we really start to put together the puzzle of how we can, um, together with our patients, make the best decisions. 
I'd like to finish up by talking about a little bit where I think this whole field is going. So I've just given you an example of a clinical trial, and that's, that tends to be our, our model with which we collect it. We, have, we ask a question, and we follow patients, or we, we randomize, or we do that. Um, but now that we're beginning to collect patient board outcome data in routine clinical care, I think it's opening up a whole new world for us and a different model of being able to understand things. So I looked just recently at our, just at, just at my hospital in terms of the amount of patient board outcome data that we've collected as part of routine clinical care, um, and it's, it's significant. And so while we collected that information in clinical care, we can look at it in different ways. And so we can look at it from a comparative effectiveness perspective, um, which we have done that in our own series in breast, and actually found in a, um, using our database, the same findings as our, as, um, as our prospective trial in terms of implants and autologous. I just an example from the prostate literature, or the, um, from our, plastic, our prostate database, is we had, um, we asked a, a patient, again, a question that patients ask of the urologist is, one year after prostatectomy, can urinary and erectile function still improve? And so with that information, essentially what my co colleagues, Andrew Vicker's team, went back to, they looked at the urology database, all the PRO data that had been collected. They pulled out 3,000 patients that fit that criteria, and they were able to answer that question. They were able to say, yes, actually, and patients followed at our institution, we were that, that, that these functions do continue to improve over, over um, uh, beyond a year. So I think this is, it's all complementary information. We're still going to do our randomized trials. We're still going to do our clinical trials and, and different ways that we look at information. But this, this combination of collecting patient board outcomes in routine clinical care is going to unlock a lot of additional data that we can look at in different ways. So in conclusion, I think the opportunity for patient board outcomes in surgery and in healthcare overall is that we can use our patient board outcome measures to actually improve individual patient care. We can, in that we can walk into a room and instead of saying, how are you doing, and, and a woman says, I, I'm okay, we can actually have a much more focused, more efficient, effective discussion about what, what, might, what we may or may not be able to do to help. It promotes patient-centered quality improvement. If we're going to put our quality improvement efforts and look at what, what matters most, we should know what matters most to patients, and then also be able to make changes, as we've done, say, in our ambulatory surgery environment, make changes, and then check again, measure again. So continuous quality improvement, identifying issues, and then, and then working to make things better. Determining value, understanding um, the, what, what's valuable to patients and to clinicians in terms of outcomes. Evaluating from a comparative effectiveness perspective, techniques and technologies, what's new, what's new and actually better from the patient perspective. And, and where I think this is going is being able to predict outcomes, being able to help collecting big, the big data of patient port outcomes to actually be able to understand what, what women are expecting. And I say women from a breast perspective, but it doesn't, it's, it's what our patients overall are experiencing in both the short term, like what is a recovery looking like, and the long term, the, the long term that we actually have not had a very good handle on. What, is, what are outcomes like at two and five and 10 years for our patients? Patient board outcome measurement gives us that opportunity. And so the idea of getting our arms around big data of both short-term and long-term, I think is really going to shed light in areas that we've never, and, and, t and we're going to learn things that we didn't, we didn't even know that we didn't know. I'd like to thank the various organizations that have supported this work, um, AHRQ, PCORI, National Cancer Institute, the American College of Surgeons. I would also point out that there's been um, the Plastic Surgery Foundation, which actually, I must say, the Plastic Surgery Foundation was where I got my start in all this work. They, we talked about the breast cue very early on, and, um, and none of this would have been possible without the foundation. Um, for those of you who are interested in this work, there's some great opportunities for education. We've, um, our team has put on, with support from um, HRQ and PCORI, we've put on um, various symposiums. we put on two symposiums. The International Society of Quality of Life Research, ISOQUAL, and their meeting is coming up next week, is a great opportunity to learn more. And the American College of Surgeon, so, uh, Surgeons is really um, making, has tremendous initiatives in this area and is similarly uh, working to educate and spread the word. I'll leave you with this um, comment by Bill Gates. I've been struck again and again by how important measurement is to improving the human condition. Thank you for your attention.